Good brain health and mental well-being are the biggest challenges of the 21st century. How do we keep our minds functioning better for longer throughout the whole life course, especially now that we're living longer? And also, how do we have a good sense of mental well-being? Now, these two topics were the focus of the UK government foresight project on mental capital and well-being, because the government wanted to address two important problems that we have. The first problem was that we're living for longer and age is a big risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So as we go into old age, we have to keep our brains fit and we have to have good cognition and well-being throughout our whole life course, which may be these days up to 90 years of age or 100 years of age. The other concern that they had was that the government and businesses were losing a lot of money due to days lost at work due to depression. So how can we keep a good sense of well-being throughout the life course? And in that project, we looked at both promoting factors for good brain health and well-being, and so, those were such things as a good education, and we looked at detracting factors for good brain health, and those are such things as stress, substance abuse, and those sorts of things. Now, my own work has focused on how can we enhance our cognitive function, and also our well-being, our motivation. And during the course of that work, which my work mainly focuses on neuropsychiatric disorders, disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, where we have some good cognitive enhancing drugs. But in the process of doing that work, I've also been involved in the interaction of neuroscience with society. And we call this neuroethics. So I'll just explain a little bit about the field and also about my own research to try to highlight the importance of the area and the drugs that we have that we can use to boost cognition in people who need boosts, such as those with cognitive impairments due to neuropsychiatric disorders or brain injury, but also about the increasing lifestyle use of some of these drugs by healthy people which brings us to the neuroethical issues and how we see ourselves as a society and how we see ourselves mo moving forward to make sure that we have good cognition and well-being and what ways do we want to develop that? How do we want to achieve that goal? My story starts a long time ago, really. I did some of the, I opened up some of the first memory clinics, one in America with David Drachman many years ago, and also at the Institute of Psychiatry with Raymond Levy and Mike Philpott. These memory clinics were really to help to do early detection of Alzheimer's disease. And we actually also developed some of the first uh, very good tools for early detection of Alzheimer's disease, and these are called the CANTAB tests. And I'm co-inventor of these tests, which run on a touch-sensitive screen. And the reason they were developed was because we didn't have very good tools for early detection of the memory problems in Alzheimer's disease. And we knew that there were possibility of good drugs to treat these cognitive impairments, such as the memory problems, were on the horizon, but we needed to detect people who had these problems early on. Because, as, as you may know, in Alzheimer's disease, there are plaques and tangles in areas of the brain, particularly starting in the hippocampal formation area, the kind of area behind your ear, and those plaques and tangles actually are the neuropathological changes which impair memory function. So we need to find good ways to counteract the neuropathological changes that we see in the brain and to, to try to promote that better. Now, now, pharmaceutical companies are developing what we call neuroprotective agents. And these drugs will actually halt the underlying disease process. But before we had those, we had what we call the cholinesterase inhibitor drugs. Now, those drugs act by boosting a chemical in the brain called acetylcholine. And, and what it does is to improve concentration and attention in people with Alzheimer's disease. In our own studies, which we published in The Lancet many years ago, these were proof of concept studies for these cholinesterase inhibitor drugs in patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease, we were able to show good improvements 
in concentration and attention. But unfortunately, we couldn't see really good improvements in episodic memory. And episodic memory is a type of memory that we use every day. So for instance, if you park your car in a multi-story car park, and then you have to remember, oh, where did I leave my car? It's that type of memory. Or if you sort of uh, rush into your house and you open the door with your keys and then you throw your keys somewhere and then later, a few hours later, you're deciding to leave the house and you think, oh, where did I leave my keys? And you try to remember where they are. That's episodic memory. So you could see we use it every day and if it was impaired, it would be very difficult to function. And we've actually shown that Cantab pal test is very strongly related to functional outcome. And we use that test on an iPad for early detection of memory problems in the clinic. So what we have are the cholinesterase inhibitor drugs. Those are drugs known as Aricet or Dinepazil and other types of drugs like that. And they, they essentially boost acetylcholine in the brain. In ADHD, we've been using drugs, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We've been using drugs such as the stimulant drugs, um, often known as uh, amphetamine salts or Adderall. And we've also been using methylphenidate or Ritalin, as it's known. And these drugs, actually Ritalin is a very effective treatment for ADHD. And it works in about 70% of patients to help them function on a daily basis. And it seems to help with the sustained attention, which is a major problem that they have. So we use, again, some of the CANTAB tests in the clinic to assess uh, how well they can actually sustain their attention. We use a test called the Rapid Visual Information Processing Task, which is a CANTAB task. And we find that uh, we do get very good effects uh, looking at the effects of methylphenidate on that task and it does seem to uh, improve performance greatly. Now the interesting thing is, when we look at the effects of methylphenidate in healthy people, we also see improvements. So these drugs aren't just working on uh, people who have problems in cognition due to neuropsychiatric disorders, they also seem to improve cognitive function in healthy people. Now more recently, we've been working with a drug called modafinil. Now, modafinil is actually uh, uh, approved by the FDA in America, and uh, also it's approved over in, here in the UK for the treatment of narcolepsy, which is excessive daytime sleepiness. In the USA, it's also got another indication, and that indication is for sleep disturbance due to shift work, because modafinil has been found to um, in, reduce accidents in people who are shift workers. And we've been looking at modafinil as an add-on to uh, antipsychotic medication for people with, say, uh, first episode psychosis or schizophrenia. Now, in people with schizophrenia, you have three separate problems. We have the psychotic symptoms, which are the hallucinations and delusions. So hallucinations are the hearing of voices. Delusions are the abnormal thoughts, unusual thoughts that people have. Those psychotic symptoms are reasonably well treated by the antipsychotic drugs that we have. And these are D2 receptor blocker drugs. But what is not well treated as yet are the cognitive problems that schizophrenic patients have, and also the motivational problems, sometimes known as the negative symptoms that schizophrenic patients have. Now, the FDA has realized that the important part of the treatment for people with schizophrenia would be to boost their cognition, because they've actually decided that the problems that they have with rehabilitation and why you know, if, if you're a student and you get diagnosed as having schizophrenia when you're at university, it's difficult sometimes for you to get back into university and to really focus on your studies and get on with your studies. Or if you've been diagnosed at work and then you find it difficult to actually um, engage again with your work and to learn new things in, in the work environment. These are cognitive problems that people have. So, so the government's realized that the biggest barrier to rehabilitation is actually the cognitive problems. And so these need a treatment. But as yet, we don't have any uh, drug treatments that are approved for that. So with our projects here in Cambridge, in my laboratory, we've actually been using cognitive training, but gamifying it so that we could improve um, 
cognition in people with schizophrenia improves their, for instance, episodic memory using games. But another thing that we've tried to do is to enhance their cognition by adding on modafinil. And what we found there is that we uh, do get very good uh, changes, improvements in working memory, which is a very important kind of memory. It's a sort of core bit to all the, what we call executive function tasks, the higher level cognitive tasks, such as planning, problem solving, the type of things that you have to do at university or at work. Um, this drug, modafinil, seems to act on noradrenaline, the chemical in the brain, dopamine, but also it seems to affect the GABA glutamate balance and maybe even affect glutamate directly. And that's how we think it exerts its cognitive enhancing effects. So in the course of our studies with patients with schizophrenia and also in, in other groups of patients, we're looking at depression we found that modafinil can be an effective uh, cognitive enhancing drug for these people. It also affects um, task-related motivation. So for tasks that we found unenjoyable or you know, not very interesting for people, it seems to make people more motivated to do them, which means to some extent it's an interesting workplace drug. Individuals in our society have been realizing this and healthy people have decided to use this drug. And when I've found out why people are using it, that seems to be for three main reasons. One, healthy people want to get the competitive edge at university or work or school or get into better university. The second reason seems to be to stay awake and alert for longer periods of time. So for instance, many of the academic colleagues that I have use it to counteract the effects of jet lag when I've spoken to them. And in the city, people use it because they have to work long hours and they want to stay awake and alert. And people in Silicon Valley are using some of these cognitive enhancing drugs too. And then the third reason seems to be that for tasks that people have been putting off and haven't found um, you know, that they're motivated to do, it helps them get stuck into the task and to do it. In terms of clinical treatments, I think if we can combine some of these cognitive enhancing drugs with such things as cognitive training using games, which are motivating and fun, we will probably get the best boost out of cognition for people with neuropsychiatric disorders and brain injury. So some of my concerns about using these cognitive enhancing drugs in healthy people are really, first of all, the safety issues. We have no long-term studies in healthy people showing that these drugs are safe. So we really need those studies before healthy people can use these cognitive enhancing drugs that are currently prescription-only medications. The second thing I'm concerned about is because of the, they're difficult to access, people are buying these drugs over the internet. And this is an incredibly dangerous way to get prescription-only medications. So you don't really know what you're buying. It could be anything. You don't know whether if you're taking another medication, you'll get a drug-drug interaction, and that could be very dangerous. So we have to be concerned about that. And my third concern is more of a societal and neuroethical issue. I mean, what kind of a society are we developing into? Will we take these cognitive enhancing drugs in the future so that we can have a better balanced work-life balance so we can get our work done in a shorter period of time and then maybe expand our, ourselves by spending more time with our families and, and um, you know, maybe going to... Uh, lifelong education or something like that, where we uh, have more leisure time so we'll be able to enjoy ourselves. Will we get a better work-life balance using these drugs in the future if they become, if we know that they're safe? Or will we just accelerate into a 24-7 society and we will work all the time because we can work all the time? And there's already so much stress in society. Some of this has been caused by the globalization and there's you know, more and more pressure uh, on people for long, long working hours. And so, so this is one reason why people, some people are taking these drugs to kind of cope with some of the demands at work. And I think really as a society, we have to think, how do we want to boost our cognition? Exercise is a fantastic way to boost your brain power. And also, of course, it's good for your mood and it's good for your physical health. So I highly recommend exercise as a good way for healthy people to boost their cognition. But we do need to develop some more of these cognitive enhancing drugs, more effective ones uh, and, and obviously safe ones for people who have neuropsychiatric disorders and brain injury.